May our study together be beneficial, not only for ourselves, but for all beings everywhere. So I hope that you enjoyed your first week of study with the first four sutras. And I look forward to, as we complete this initial component, I look forward to hearing from each of you and for one another, the um, insights that have come to you with studying the first four sutras. So as we've all experienced, um, life has lots of demands on our minds and our emotions, and often they are you know, buffeted about, let's say, in a way that seems completely out of control. I know that I've experienced that at times. And the Yoga Sutras serve to help us to understand how these turnings of the mind can distort our perception of ourselves and of the world. But we also learn how to gain control over these turnings of the mind to have clear and accurate perception. So some of you have been studying the Yoga Sutras with me for a while. Some are studying also with Yogacharya O'Brien and as well as other teachers in this tradition. So you may know a little bit about the background of the Yoga Sutras from your own study or study with others. And you will know that it's a series of progressive teachings on the nature of the mind offered by Patanjali around 200 to 300 CE, we think. And they begin with a definition of yoga, an outlining of the goal of yoga, followed by detail to the means to achieve that goal, instruction on how to restrain the mental fluctuations, then the physical and mental abilities that these practices enhanced are discussed, including the pitfalls that may arise if we're not mindful and intentional. And finally, there's a description of what success looks like as full liberation of consciousness or kavalya, meaning complete aloneness or self-reliance, self with a capital S, reliance. And the great gift of the sutras is ways to help us know when we're making progress toward that goal. So the text, it's laid out in a style that's meant to be um, memorized. Each is, you know, each of the verses is a thread or a string in a series of abbreviations of a larger exposition that was offered verbally by the teacher. And the abbreviation um, can be memorized and each one flows into the next. So what I always think is, wow, what a way to be self-reliant, to carry the teachings in our mind without the need for written reference. I have not succeeded in memorizing all the sutras. And I'm not expecting that to have happened for you by the end of our study together. It could, not necessarily in Sanskrit, but in English, it could happen. And it's a, a worthy goal yet it's not a requirement for this time. So let's look at the sutras that you were contemplating over the past week. So sutra one through four in book one or pada one. One, now the teachings of yoga begin. Two, samadhi is experienced when we gain control over the waves of thought in the mind. Then, Sutra 3, the seer abides in their essential nature. Then meaning when the thought waves are controlled. Four, 
when thoughts are uncontrolled, the seer identifies with the waves of thought rather than their own essential nature. The opening words of the first pada call attention to the auspiciousness of the now moment. Not simply the moment when we commence our study of the text, these many centuries after Patanjali compiled them from the Vedas, but they point to the eternal now in which yoga is practiced and experienced. And one thing that comes to me often when I you know, begin the sutras again, I think about the timelessness of these teachings. You know, they come out of ancient India and are the core of the Hindu religion, but they're not limited to the time in which they were written. The same now that Patanjali speaks of is the now in which we sit together. I would say the only difference between Patanjali's now when he sat with his students, maybe under a tree in a cave or in a simple stone temple. The only difference being like the language they spoke and the customs of their local culture. And that would be the same for any group studying the sutras right now. The only difference between us and Italians studying together is they're speaking Italian. <laughs> and they may have customs in their local culture that doesn't um, allow for certain situations. Let's say right now, uh, local cultures are requesting social distancing. So you couldn't sit very close to one another, you know, whatever it is. But the only difference is that this is now for Patanjali, now for anyone studying the sutras throughout time. And yoga is practiced in the present moment. Yoga is defined in the sutras as to bring or hold together completely. In this case, we're holding together the sense mind with a chosen object of focus. The goal being stillness of mind achieved by single pointed focus, which allows us to see behind the veil of sense mind. So when we do, we experience our essence of being. In contemplating and looking at my mind in the moment, not in this moment, but when I was looking at my mind and thinking, you know, this is like, and this is a, a usual metaphor used, but it's like waves on the ocean or on a lake but they are caused by wind or energy that is um, moving through the water on the surface of the water. And it causes it to move like in a circular motion, lifting up and falling back down and swirling. So movement in the mind or the vrittis or the outflowing energy of the mind in contact with the senses which are in contact with the objects that we are perceiving is very similar to this wind moving over the surface of the water, causing the water to move and rise and fall. So the way the vrittis are moving, the outflowing energy of mind in contact with the senses, it's like a feedback loop. Mm. And though it's natural to the human being to have this feedback loop, which is necessary for our navigation of the manifest world, it creates a turbulence. And when that turbulence is sustained without ceasing, it creates this illusion that our existence is intended to be wave-like, that that's the way things are, that's the way our mind is, that changing conditions, which actually are, you know, an aspect of the manifest realm, but that that is us, that we identify with that as the way that we are. We don't know 
that our essence under the surface is the deep, that it is still. We don't realize that the waves of thought arising are not separate from this vaster body of water. It's just simply energy moving on the surface, energy moving on the surface of the water. And what's a game changer for us as yogis is when we discover that we can stop waving and we can allow our senses to return to their origins. We can allow our consciousness to return to awareness of our source. This affirmation for a study of sutras one through four. May the peace of meditation be my anchor today as I witness waves of thoughts of, and emotions arise and dissolve. May the peace of meditation be my anchor today as I witness waves of thoughts and emotions arise and dissolve. 